God bless you today. How are you guys doing? Doing all right? Good. Hey, my name's Evan. I'm one of the uh, pastors here. Pastor Doug and some of the worship team are in Florida, sunny Florida, right now, uh, ministering at Pastor Steve Thompson's church down there. And so uh, he sends his blessings and his greetings to you. And so let's remember him and the worship team this morning. Amen. Let's pray for a safe return and that God would just continue to use them in a powerful way as they pour into that church down there. Um, We are going to continue this morning in the series, Acts Like the Church, and I'd like to ask you guys to pray with me as we get into that word. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together, to join as family, God, to join as the body of Christ, as believers, and God, even as people who who may just be looking and searching and and wanting to know and understand more about God. God, we ask that uh, you would open each one of our hearts this morning, that you would do a supernatural work within all of us, God, that we would be ready and willing to receive what your word says, that we would be ready and willing to be changed as your Holy Spirit would lead and direct us to be changed. God, orchestrate this time together. God, we ask that you would use this word to put to death things that need to die and that you would use it to bring to life things that need to live and grow. God, we thank you, give you all praise and all glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, we're going to talk about maintaining momentum, maintaining momentum. And Pastor Doug has been in the early portions of the book of Acts, and we've been looking at the early church and how they started and what they were putting into practice and and how they grew and all of those types of things. And we're going to continue looking at that this morning And I want to ask us a question as we get into this, what area of your life, of my life, could be greatly impacted if we gained a little momentum in that area? What area of your life could be greatly impacted for the better? What what area of your life could be changed for the better if you gained a little momentum in that area? there's, There's a few things that came to my mind as I began to think of momentum. And um, my first example, I did not think of my mother being on the front row when I thought of this example. And so um, I'm a little hesitant to share this, but one night when I first began uh, serving the Lord, I just began to feel just guilty and I went to her and just began repenting and confessing some things. And after a little while into it, she said, that's enough, just no more. And so this might be one of those stories, mom. So, um, but when I think of momentum, I think of a 1979 Ford LTD 2. And that is not me, nor any girl that I knew when I owned a Ford uh, LTD, nor did my LTD look that nice. But I had one of those and um, I was hanging out at a friend's house and his driveway came in, and there was this long driveway that went to a barn, and then it split off, and so there was a lower driveway, but then there was another part that split up and went up to their house, and so you'd go up this hill, and a, you, you would park on this landing, and then his house was up here, so there was this lower driveway, a hill, and then his landing and this separate driveway, so we were going to his house, and I, and I parked up um, on the top of his landing, and it was cold, it was the middle of winter, and we were leaving, and, or I was leaving. And so I don't know if you've ever tried to turn around something that's like 42 feet long, but it's pretty difficult. And so I'm like making these, you know, stop, reverse, stop, reverse, and my tires get over on the edge of this hill up on this landing of this hill, and it's winter. Now, I'd bought this car for $250, so... It is what it is. And so my tires are over on the edge of this hill that are, you know, there's the lower driveway, then there's just this large set of trees and this big hill. And so my tires go over on the side of this hill and the momentum, the weight of that car began to push that car over the hill. And so I literally jumped out of the car. It was going down the hill. I had to jump out of the car. It went down the hill Sorry, mom. Over the, over the lower driveway, and it smashed into this tree and stopped from going down over the hill. I had to call a tow truck and 
got the car out and went home. And, um, but the momentum, the weight, the force of that car, no matter how hard I pressed the brakes, was not stopping the momentum that that car had gained. Um, I also think of Bo Jackson. You guys know who Bo Jackson is? Anybody? If you don't know who Bo Jackson is, you should. When I was a kid, Bo Jackson was the man. And one of the most famous collisions in NFL history took place between, this is it right here, Bo Jackson and this other guy named Brian Bosworth. Now, Brian Bosworth was this, uh, you know, he had a bad attitude. He was like the bad guy of the NFL. And leading up to this game, they were excited about the possibilities of these two players matching up. Now, Bo Jackson was just a beast. And he got the ball. They were like on the five-yard line, and it just lined up perfectly. Brian Bosworth, Bo Jackson were going to meet each other. And they did. And the strength and the force and the momentum that Bo Jackson had, literally when Brian Bosworth uh, hit him, he, he carried him into the end zone and he scored a touchdown. And everyone went wild because they wanted Bo Jackson uh, to, to win. I also think of like a, a, a wave, if you've ever been to the ocean, when that wave comes forward. Um, we've only been to a couple oceans, uh, but the Pacific Ocean was so much uh, more powerful than, um, you know, the other oceans that we've been to. And um, when that wave would come forward, the force, I mean, it could literally just knock you over. And, and, and even it has the power out in the sea, out in the open to, to capsize ships. And so momentum is a powerful, powerful thing. This word momentum means the driving force gained by the development of a process or course of events. There's this force that is gained by the development of a process or events. Now, when, you, when something gathers momentum or when we gather momentum in our life or even as a church body, momentum can cause that object to continue to move forward even when it meets resistance. The momentum of that thing can literally push and carry that thing forward even against resistance. Now, Pastor Doug shared with us a few weeks ago um, some things that we saw throughout the book of Acts. And I, and I want to refresh our memory of those things. In Acts chapter 1, verse 15, it says that there was 120 disciples that were gathered after Jesus had ascended back into heaven. In Acts chapter 2, verse 41, it shares how it was the day of Pentecost, the apostle Peter preached, and it says that that day 3,000 people got saved or were added to the body of Christ. So they went from um, 120 people to 3,000. A few verses later, it says that people were being added daily. So even at a bare minimum, if one person was being added a day to the body of Christ, and that went on for a year, that was an additional 365 people at minimum. In Acts 4, 4 verse 4, it said that they had grown to 5,000 people. 5.14 said they were increasingly added, and there, there was a, a multitude and so I'm, I'm refreshing as a, of this because we can see that the early church was gaining some serious momentum. In Acts 5.28, it says that they filled Jerusalem with their teaching. They were literally overtaking and filling a city with the gospel, with the message of Jesus Christ. And this is where we're going to pick up in Acts 5 verse 28, Okay. And, and stick with me, because I know we're, we're talking about what the early church did, but what I'm sharing with us this morning, what I believe God wants us to hear, could literally change and impact our individual lives if we will walk in, I believe, what God wants us to hear this morning. So, so I want you to pay attention and to listen. Now, uh, verse 27 in Acts chapter 5, it says, Having brought the apostles... They made them appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. So the Sanhedrin was this board of religious rulers and, and leaders. And so they, they, the apostles had to go before this, this group of people. And here's what they said. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior 
that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, when the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But, but look what happens here. A, man, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, he was one of the Sanhedrin, who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed the rest of the, the Sanhedrin. Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Theatus appeared claiming to be somebody and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, all his followers was, were dispersed and it all came to nothing. Or in other words, their momentum was put to a stop. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone, let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, listen to this. If it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will find yourself fighting against God. The momentum that the, the, the apostles had behind them, the, the, the driving force that they had was obviously the Holy Spirit and God. And Gamaliel was recognizing that there was something supernatural that was taking place. And he said, if you try to stop these men, you'll find yourself fighting against God. It would kind of be like me in that Ford LTD. No matter how hard I was pressing the brakes, that car was still going down that hill. It'd be kind of like me trying to, to stop Bo Jackson from going into the end zone. It's not happening. And so the early church was experiencing this tremendous momentum. And we, even as a church body, have even experienced some of this to a degree. Pastor Doug shared recently that in the past couple months, we've seen, well, we've documented 115 some people who have committed or had a desire to raise their hand and to fill out a card saying, I want God in my life. That's amazing, people. That is amazing. Two weekends ago, we baptized 50-some people between our two campuses, Harrison and Batesville. That is amazing. Can we put our hands together for that? And we believe that that kind of thing is going to continue to take place. But if they experienced that in the early church, how do we experience that? How do we experience golly momentum as individuals, as, as families, and even as a church body? How do we, how do you and I experience godly momentum in our lives? The early church maintained momentum. Here's what I believe. I think there's a couple things that we can really gather even just looking at the first five chapters of the book of Acts, there's some things that we see them putting into practice in a way that they lived that I believe helped maintain the momentum that they were experiencing. And the first thing is this, they walked in wisdom. Now wisdom is, is the ability to, to apply what you know. It's, it's the careful application of, of understanding. It's the ability to apply knowledge. Now Proverbs 9 verse 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord, a respect and honoring, a reverence of God is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So you want to understand life? You want to understand relationship? The Bible tells us that it begins with a, with a knowledge of who God is. And then if we want to know how to apply what we know about God, it says that we have to walk fearfully and reverently with respect before God. And the, the early church, the apostles, the disciples, absolutely walked in a reverent fear before the Lord. Now, I just went through the first five chapters, and I found 18 what I would consider references to the early church walking in wisdom or walking in fear before the Lord. 
18 references. It's literally, go through it, look for yourselves. It's like every few verses you see that the disciples were giving some type of glory, some type of honor. They were joining together in prayer. They were defending what they were doing in the name of Christ, not under their own name or under their own power. It's like every few verses you see them honoring and revering the Lord. For you and I in our lives, our purpose begins with, with honoring the Lord, with a respect for God. And I, I've got a few uh, questions for you and I to answer. Three questions to answer when, when you and I are unsure of our purpose or how to walk out our lives before God, okay? Here's the first one. What has God started in you? What work has God started in you? Now, Philippians 1 verse 6 says that he is faithful to bring to completion every good work that he starts in you. So when you're unsure, what do I do? What, what, what's my purpose? How do I fulfill? How do I walk out my life reverently before God? The first thing that I think you should ask is, what has God started in you? For the disciples, what we see in Acts is God had started within them a faith. A basic faith and a belief that God was who he says he was, that Jesus was who he says he was, and that when God spoke something and commanded them to do it, they were willing to obey. They had a faith within them. The second question I think we should ask is, where has God put you? Where's God put you? What city do you live in? Where do you work? What neighborhood do you live in? What church do you go to? For for the disciples, Jesus told them to go to Jerusalem. That's exactly what they did. They had a faith in God and they went to the city that Jesus told them to wait in and look at what happened by those two simple acts of obedience. And then the third question is, what has God given you? So what has God started in you? Where do you live? Where has he put you? And what has he given you? As the disciples were waiting in Jerusalem, He filled them with with power and enabling the ability to do what God had asked of them through the Holy Spirit. And of course, there was the gifts that he placed within them, spiritual gifts, and even just the gifts that they they were born with. What has God given you? What has he placed within you that could be used for his glory? Because if we're not walking in wisdom, which I'm equating to, the fear of the Lord. We're either just living these totally random, meaningless lives, or our lives are filled with purpose and meaning. We're either doing what we're doing for a reason or we're wandering about aimlessly. And I'm saying to us this morning, hey, let's, let's live with some purpose. Yeah. Let's live with some passion. Let's live with a faith and a belief that God can use us exactly where we are, amen? Amen. So they walked in wisdom before the Lord. Okay, that's the first thing that I believe helped them to experience the the momentum that they experienced in the early church. The second thing, and this, listen, this goes hand in hand, is they lived in unity. They lived in unity. Now, I went through um, the first five books again, and I found five references to the, what I would consider references to them living in unity. Uh, Let me read one of them to you, actually. Acts 4, verse 32. It says, All the believers were one in heart and mind. Wow. All the believers were one in heart and mind. Imagine what could take place if we were one in heart and one in mind, what we could experience. Now, I don't know how many of you follow basketball. I don't follow basketball a whole lot. When I was younger, I I used to really like basketball and paid a lot of of attention to it, but that was a long time ago. But I've got boys, and my boys love basketball and and sports, and so they've kind of ignited this, um, just this interest again in sports. And so they uh, they like the Golden State Warriors. Now, if you guys know this, the Golden State Warriors this season just broke the record for the most wins in a regular season, right? Right? And they're big Curry fans, and I like Curry and all this and that. But listen, um, I didn't want them to beat the record. I didn't want them to beat the record. 
because the record was held by the 96 Chicago Bulls team. See, did you hear that, E? <coughs> I loved the Bulls when I was a kid, and they were, uh, they were without a doubt my favorite team. I, I had Jordans, the whole nine yard. I mean, I loved the Chicago Bulls. And in 96, they had broken the record. They went 92 and 10 in 1996. Uh, I'm sorry, 72 and 10 in 96. F uh, amazing. They only lost like five home games that whole year. They lost uh, three um, postseason games as they were going toward the championship. And one of the teammates on the team, Ron Harper, they broke the record, but you know what? They had tasted victory prior to this. And so Ron Harper said, listen, guys, 72 and 10 don't mean a thing without the ring. And he actually made shirts for the entire team. And um, I just, I, I keep telling Eli that, like, listen, buddy, Golden State Warriors, yeah, 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 but it don't mean a thing without the ring, buddy. Now, if one player on the Warriors or even on the Bulls team had been out of sync with the heart and the mission of that team, it would have disrupted the entire momentum that those teams have experienced. It would have disrupted everything that they were experiencing as a team. And you think of the Bulls, there were so many personalities on that team. I mean, they had Michael Jordan, which the greatest basketball player of all time. They had Dennis Rodman, which is, I don't know if you guys, just these huge, giant personalities. They, all, they had Scottie Pippen, who, who I believe in his own right was a superstar, but he was playing next to Michael Jordan. It, it would have been so easy. And then they had all these position and support roles. It would have been so easy for the personalities and for the pride and for, the, for all of those types of things to rise up, but they had one mission, one goal, to win the championship. Now, isn't the body of Christ just like that? Different people, different colors, different gifts, different callings, but one body. One body. Can we say that? One body. Now look at what it says in Romans verse, chapter 12, verse 3. It says, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. What if we just shut her down right here? We could go home with that one passage of scripture and, and think about that and meditate on that and allow the, work, the Lord to work in our hearts just on that one sentence. But rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body and each member belongs to all the others. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever looked at it that way, that we're actually accountable and responsible to one another, to the person that you're sitting next to? Yes, of course, we're, we're responsible unto God, but you know what? God's put us on this earth with people, and we're responsible to one another for how we conduct our lives, for how we use the gifts that he's placed within us. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. I believe that the early church experienced momentum because they were united, absolutely united in purpose and in belief. And I want to encourage us with that, man, to, to, to be united in purpose and belief. We've said it uh, a couple of nights of prayer here and there that it's hard to tear down who and what you've been praying for. It's hard, to, it's hard to, to, to mock or to tear down who and what you've been praying for. And, and I want to say this to us as well. You and I will never experience momentum in our life if we spend our te time tearing down the body that Christ died to build up. We will never experience the momentum in our lives that God desires for us to have, or even as a church, if we spend our time tearing down that which Christ came to save and to build up. So here's, here's, a, here's a thought for us. Rather than you and I trying to figure out all the things that are wrong with the body of Christ, 
What if we spend our time doing the things that we know are right? What if we spend our time encouraging one another, praying for one another, lifting each other up with all uh, spiritual songs and hymns? What if, what if we decided to, to, to allow our hearts to be united rather than uh, sharing all the blog posts or, or writing the tweets and all this and that with all the things that could be fixed? With, and listen, listen. I don't like every song that's out there. I don't like every message that's shared by a preacher. I'm not in agreement with everything either. But listen, what if we spent our time doing the things that we know are pleasing and right rather than tearing down what Christ died to build up? Let's give some grace. Let's give some grace to one another. And I know that there's a standard that we have to uphold And there's a truth that we should live by and and never back down from. But listen, my boys are on the front row. They could come up here and and they could could spend the rest of this service and probably the next service too telling you all the mistakes I've made and the ways that I've been a bad example to them. But man, Jesus told us to take the plank out of our own eye first before we try to remove it from someone else. And let's walk in unity. Amen? Amen. Can we say that this morning? God, unify our hearts. Let's say that. God, unify our hearts. Let's say it one more time. God, unify our hearts. And I believe that as we walk in unity with each other, and as we walk reverently and fearfully, fearfully before the Lord, that Just like the early church, because they walked in wisdom and unity, they experienced fruitfulness and multiplication. We shared the numbers. I mean, we saw what was taking place. They were just rapidly experiencing the work and and the favor of God in their lives. Now, we've got a couple apple trees in our yard, and, and, and those, when those trees bring forth fruit, apples, you cut that apple open, and we know this, there's seeds contained within that, within that apple. And we could take those seeds and plant it, and then those seeds would bring forth more fruit. And so as we experience fruitfulness in our lives, in our marriages, in our church, as we continue to see uh, uh, people being saved, you know, sometimes we come and say, oh man, that's awesome. That's people getting saved. But we've all got people that we wanna see saved. And for that person that's getting saved, that was somebody's person that they wanted to get saved. Amen? And so man, it's more than just this, this prayer or this thing that takes place. There's fruitfulness that we're experiencing. And there's fruitfulness that some individual is experiencing as they've labored, as they've prayed, as they've been a model, as they've walked out Christ before people, they're experiencing a fruitfulness. And I believe that as as we do that, there will continue to be more multiplication, not just in this church, but in our individual lives, in our families, and in our homes. So I want us to put this up. These are the things that we need to maintain. Can you guys put that slide up, please? We need to maintain Wisdom, unity, fruitfulness, and multiplication. Wisdom, unity, fruitfulness, and multiplication. Guys, put the next one up. And we need to avoid foolishness. When I think of the opposite of wisdom, I think of foolishness. And and foolishness is just a a disregard, a disrespect, a a dishonoring of who God is and what his word says and and the standards and the practices and the things that he's established in his word. Foolishness is just a setting aside of these things and saying, you know what? I'm wise in my own eyes. Let's avoid that. Let's avoid that and realize that, you know what? You and I, we're not perfect people. We don't have it all together. We don't know everything. And that there's a God who who knit us together while we're in our mother's womb who has a plan and a purpose for each and every one of our lives. When I think of the opposite of unity, I think of isolation. And Pastor Doug 
preached about this a couple weeks ago, how those animals, those predatory animals, when, when they're chasing a herd and, and they're wanting to get a meal, they, they wait for that one animal who will break forth and, 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 and go alone, who will isolate themselves so then they can, they can pounce and, 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 and attack that one person. Man, we cannot walk in isolation. If, if, we wanna, if we wanna grow in the things of God, just like that said during the announcement video, then we have to be growing in our relationship with people. It goes hand in hand. Let's avoid isolation. When I think of the opposite of fruitfulness, I think of idleness. Just a standing still. A, a lack of pursuing the things that God's placed within our hearts. I believe this morning that there are things that God has placed within our hearts that, that we're, 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 we're standing back on. We're fearful. We're afraid. Man, let's move forward and believe that God can allow those things to become fruitful in Jesus' name, amen? Let's avoid idleness. And when I think of the opposite of multiplication, I think of division. Division, divisiveness, backbiting, bitterness, jealousy, disrespect. So what do you think this morning as we look at some of these things? What do you think is God's will for for your life, for, for, his, for church on fire, for, for the body of Christ. What do you think is God's will? Do you think it's that we walk in foolishness, idleness, isolation and division, or do you think that God desires that we continue to experience godly momentum in our lives and as a church, as we walk in wisdom, unity, fruitfulness and multiplication, God desires momentum. God wants momentum for our lives, amen? Here's what we have to be aware of though. There will always be opposition. There's always gonna be opposition. As, enc as encouraging as it can be to, to hear that God wants to uh, allow momentum to consume our lives and as encouraging as it can be to, to read about the things that we saw took place in the book of Acts, I found um, there are eight references to opposition to the momentum that the early church was experiencing. So even though they were experiencing all of these amazing things, it wasn't without opposition. Here's what some of them were. Um, in Acts 2 verse, 2 verse 13, it says they were mocked. They were arrested. There was warnings. There were threats that they received. There was jealousy, uh, more arrests, hatreds, beatings, threats. Everything that they were experiencing, all of the encouraging things that were taking place, and they counted it as joy. They were excited about the things that they were, they were facing because the Lord experienced those same things. And they thought, man, we're on the right track if we're experiencing the same things that the, our Lord experienced. Now, how easy would it have been in the midst of that opposition for the, the disciples to begin blaming God and blaming other people? Man, if Peter would just keep his big mouth shut and quit preaching and quit speaking his mind, and, and if he would just quit doing that, we wouldn't be facing the persecution that we're facing. Or if I thought God called us to go into Jerusalem and to do these things and to, and to live our lives before him, and, and all that's taking place, how easy would it have been for them to begin blaming God and one another? A wisdom says to, 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 to follow God. And unity says to, to, to stay together and to have each other's back. But when things become difficult, we always want someone to blame. We either wanna blame God or we wanna blame someone else. But I believe God is saying to us this morning, if we'll walk in wisdom and we'll walk in unity, that we will experience and continue to experience fruitfulness and multiplication in our lives and in this church. And if you agree with that, would you say amen? There will always be opposition, but it can never stop what God has declared what he has wanted to do. 
be encouraged this morning. So we're gonna, in a minute, pray over some of these things. We're gonna pray against every word that's been spoken and every thought that has been perceived in foolishness, isolation, idleness, and division. We're gonna pray against those things. That those things have no power in our lives. That, that like, like we prayed at the beginning, that things that need to die would be put to death and that things that need to live would come to life and grow. And we're gonna pray for wisdom, unity, fruitfulness, and multiplication. But before we do that, I wanna speak to all of us. You may be in this place and, and wanting to experience momentum in your life. Maybe you, are, you, you, you desire that. Godly momentum in our lives, God's plan unfolding for us, all begins at the name of Jesus Christ, at the cross. So if you're not experiencing Godly momentum, if you're, if you're stuck, if, you're, if you know that your heart is far from God, that you've never honored God with your life and, and you've never surrendered and, and, and figuratively bowed your knee before the Lord, I wanna speak to you this morning. Now is an opportunity. Now is a time for God's plan and for his love and for his grace to consume your lives and for his plan to begin unfolding for you if you'd be willing to acknowledge him and, and to welcome him into your life, if you'd be willing to receive his love and his forgiveness. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. A wage is something that we earn, right? We go to work and we expect to receive a payment. It's a wage. As strange as this may sound, when we choose to live a life of sin, we've earned it. But God's offering a gift to us, a gift, what validates a gift. A gift is something that we don't pay for, it's just something that we receive. And it says that the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So God wants to give you the gift of not just a, a, a not just a peace on earth, which we need peace on this earth, amen. amen. But God wants to give us the gift of eternal life, of, of spending eternity with him. So I want you guys to close your eyes. Every person in this room, I want you to close your eyes. And if that's you this morning, if you say, you know what? I'm ready to experience the momentum that God wants to, to allow to unfold in my life. I'm ready to acknowledge Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. That's me. I know this morning I need to surrender to the Lord, if that's you, with all eyes closed, no one's looking around, I wanna ask you to raise your hand up in the air. Just keep it up, I'm not gonna embarrass you. Anyone else, raise your hand up in the air. Say, I need Jesus this morning. Amen, who else? Anyone else, I'll wait one more second. Just raise it up in the air. Amen, amen. Guys, can we put our hands together for the hands that were raised? Of those of you that raised your hands, I want to, to ask you, there's a connect card either in the seat pocket behind you or in front of you. It looks just like this. Fill this information out and you can check, I'm committing my life to Christ or I'm renewing my commitment to Christ. Please do that this morning and you can drop it in the offering box that are in the walls or you can take it to the information center. But guys, hey, before we dismiss, I want us to do this. Let's stand on our feet. Let's grab the person's hand that we're standing next to across the rows, all the way across the rows. I know we don't wanna move or become uncomfortable, but guys, we wanna pray against these things together. Amen. Thank you guys for moving and doing that. Now guys, I don't wanna just be the only one praying. I want us to lift our voices and to pray in agreement this morning that every word that's been spoken in foolishness, in isolation, in idleness, in division, that those words are broken in the name of Jesus, that they have no power over our lives, that those thoughts have no power over our lives, 
that, that every word that's been spoken in, in, in foolishness and idleness and isolation and division against this church is broken in the name of Jesus, Lord. We believe you for the best. We believe you that your momentum will continue to unfold in our lives, Jesus. And even though that we'll face opposition, that we'll come against resistance, that he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world, we trust you this morning, Lord, in Jesus' name. So Lord, we thank you for that, that those things are broken in Jesus' name. No power, no authority. Guys, let's pray that for the person that we're holding hands with it, that, that those words and those thoughts that have, that have been perceived in our own minds and the words that have been spoken over our lives, that they have no power, no authority. Words that have been spoken in, in foolishness, in, in isolation, in idleness, in division, God, that those things are broken, Lord, and we believe the best for the people that we're holding hands with, Lord, that your momentum can consume and overtake their lives in Jesus' name. Lord, we ask you for wisdom. Let's ask him for wisdom. Lord, we ask you for wisdom. Fill our lives with wisdom, which is the holy reverence, with a fear and with a respect and an honoring of who you are and what you've done and what your word says. And God, one more time we say, unify our hearts. Let us be unified in Christ Jesus, Lord. Let us have each other's back. Let's, let us lift each other up. Let us encourage one another and, and believe the best for one another. Let us speak life into one another. God, we believe for fruitfulness and multiplication. God, in the, in the lives of the person that we're holding hands with, in our own lives and in this church, we thank you for it, Lord, for fruitfulness and for multiplication, Lord. In Jesus' name. Jesus name guys let's just you can let go of the person's hand but we're going to close this morning with the worship team leading us in one more song and so guys as we sing this song let's just have a heart that's full of faith believing and trusting that God can do everything that he says he can do amen, amen. Let's, uh, let's just grab the person's hand that we're standing next to you one more time and Guys, after we pray, I'd like for the altar workers to come forward. And if you have a, a need, there's a sickness in your body, if there's something you're believing for, a family member you're praying for, we want to pray in agreement with you. And so after we pray, the altar workers will come forward. And uh, we'd like to invite you to come forward too if you'd like someone to join with you in prayer. But God, we thank you for this morning. God, we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you that you are good and that you will never let us down. You are faithful, God. You're faithful. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Lord, we ask for your momentum to overtake our lives, Lord, that as we walk in wisdom, and God, as we walk in unity, that we will continue to experience fruitfulness and multiplication in our lives, in our families, and in this church in the name of Jesus, Lord. God, we ask for your protection and for your covering over our homes and over our relationships. God, we ask that you bless our children, that you fill their lives with, with your Holy Spirit and with your peace and with the discernment, Lord. God, that even as they hear things and, and see things, Lord, that they would discern right and wrong, Lord, and that they would have a heart and a desire to choose what is right in Jesus' name. And Lord, we pray for those that are single. God, we lift up the widow. God, we pray in Jesus' name that your blessings would overtake their lives, that your peace, your comfort, your love would fill them, your provision would consume them. Lord, that they would have an ever-present understanding that you'll never leave them nor forsake them. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we ask that you go with us and be with us. Be with Pastor Doug and the worship team. Keep them safe. Let them minister and let them have fun. Keep them safe as they come home. And uh, we thank you for them. In Jesus' name, amen.